Dr. Hansen actually spoke last year for us in, uh, in New Mexico also at a very successful conference we had. She spoke also for us at our international conference we uh, did last year in, um, in Rome, which was an excellent event it brought together people mainly throughout Europe to our event. Um, and she uh, is a psychiatrist who has a lot of experience with issues for people who, uh, who have, uh, you know, deep psychiatric issues, but she's done a lot of analysis on these issues related to euthanasia, assisted suicide for psychiatric issues. Now, this is a big issue in Canada. Certainly, it's an issue in Belgium and the Netherlands where they allow euthanasia for these issues. But in Canada, they're discussing extending uh, euthanasia to people with uh, mental illness and psychiatric concerns. And I'm assuming that in the U.S., this is certainly something they're thinking about. So I will immediately turn things over to Dr. Hansen, and she will upload her PowerPoint. And uh, thank you very much. All right, welcome everybody. Uh, I am Dr. Annette Hansen. I'm a forensic psychiatrist, which means that I evaluate and treat people with serious mental illness who are also involved in civil and legal issues. I've been involved in legislative affairs related to assisted suicide and euthanasia for several years now, and so I'm going to be speaking about my experience. I want to clarify that where I practice in the state of Maryland in the United States, these actions are still illegal. And nevertheless, we've seen some effects from them, even though the laws have not passed. So that's what I'm going to begin with. This is how I got interested in the topic. This is the late Dr. Lawrence Egbert. He was a retired anesthesiologist who was acting as medical director of the Final Exit Network. And in this capacity, in various interviews, he admitted that he had approved the involvement in his organization in as many as 300 deaths. He was also personally present and involved in 100 deaths, including three states in the U.S. where the actions were illegal. He was criminally charged in three states. Um, he also was involved in the death of six Maryland residents, none of whom were terminally ill, and three of whom had depression. He is on record in an interview with the Washington Post as saying that he favored these actions for people with serious psychiatric conditions like depression. He was given immunity from prosecution in return for his testimony against the Final Exit Network, and that organization was convicted of violating the assisted suicide prohibition in the state of Minnesota. Now, he appealed his license revocation. Um, our state licensing board became aware of this because his office was raided by the FBI during an undercover investigation of the organization. And almost immediately, the licensing board became aware of the situation. His license was revoked, but he appealed the revocation essentially to provide a forum for the organization to prevent its stance. The judge in the circuit court who heard the appeal was sympathetic to his cause and said he regretted not being able to reinstate his license, but said he was restricted by law from doing so. And his direct quote was, it may well be that someday the world will catch up with this. I have personal experience and personal knowledge of how the publicity surrounding the Right to Die movement has affected people with serious mental illness in my state. Now in the past during committee testimony on these, this bill, I've been accused of proposing scary, scary, slippery, slippery slope hypothetical situations. These are actual cases. Um, the first involved a young man from the eastern shore of Maryland. This is a part of my state that is not known for having ready access to mental health services. Um, he wanted to go to Switzerland to be euthanized. He contacted three of my fellow forensic psychiatrists because the Swiss clinic required a capacity assessment by an American psychiatrist before they would accept someone for euthanasia. My colleagues knew of my interest in this, so they contacted me and asked, well, how do I do this? And I said, well, are you really interested in committing a crime? Uh, they did not do their assessments. Um, now, unfortunately, this, this young man only provided an email address, so we had no way to track him down and get him help. He ultimately died by suicide through gunshot wound, and uh, we eventually learned that his irreversible neurologic condition was in fact schizophrenia. 
The second case I'm aware of is an elderly man who was insan an insanity acquitty. So he was found legally not responsible or adjudicated insane for a crime and was committed to a state psychiatric hospital. Now, he had a very complicated case. He had several chronic serious medical conditions, any one of which could have been terminal if he had refused treatment. He also at various times had psychotic symptoms, specifically a delusion or a false psychotic belief that he was terminally ill. It's a very complicated situation. During that particular legislative session, our assisted suicide bill almost passed. It got through the House, it passed almost through the Senate, it failed by one vote. And every year there's tremendous media coverage of the Right to Die movement. So there's a flock of people who go down to our state capitol. They are all wear bright yellow t-shirts with, you know, my right to die emblazoned on them. They do interviews, they tell very evocative stories about horrible deaths. And on the day that the bill failed by one vote, again, there was a lot of media coverage. That same day, this patient asked his treating psychiatrist to prescribe lethal medication. And then finally, uh, a, a young woman was charged with a crime. She was accused of killing a family member. And at the time of arrest, she requested lethal injection rather than go to jail. She had multiple psychiatric conditions, including a personality disorder, which under some laws would have qualified her for death. Um, fortunately, instead of being given a lethal injection, she was taken to a hospital evaluation uh, and was given psychiatric care, and she survived. Now, more remote examples uh, would be, uh, I work in a prison system. That's my uh, primary clinical site, and I care for prisoners with serious mental illness. And one elderly man in particular was given an 18-month sentence for uh, driving under the influence of alcohol. He had a very severe depression. He was very distressed. He begged me to give him a pill to euthanize him. He said, I will sign any paper you want so you won't be held responsible. Just please give me a pill to make it stop. And so I gave him a pill. Uh, I gave him an antidepressant. And a few weeks later, he came into my office, literally got down on his knees and kissed my hand and said, thank God for you and your medicine. Now, in some jurisdictions, he would have been qualified for death. Now, fortunately, our state no longer has a death penalty. But once upon a time, we did. And again, there was a prisoner who had a severe personality disorder. He was facing a life sentence. He was facing capital punishment and he volunteered for execution. And his thought was that serving a life sentence in a prison system would be too extreme for him. It would cause too much psychological suffering and he preferred to die. Um, and he was allowed to volunteer for execution. Many prison systems in the United States also have palliative care units for incarcerated offenders with serious medical conditions. I'm making this point because publicity, even without the laws, even when it's still a crime, the publicity surrounding the right to die movement is presently hurting people with serious mental illness. This is an example from 2014. Uh, Americans will recognize this woman, Brittany Menard. She was the face of assisted suicide um, earlier when she was diagnosed with a brain tumor. She traveled and moved to Oregon where it was legal and and Compassion and Choices, which is an organization which is the main proponent of these laws in the U.S., used her face as a campaign to, for membership. This uh, ad on the right here, this is an ad that their organization sponsored. And on the day that this launched and her face appeared on People magazine, the company sponsoring the, the membership campaign had to take down, the, it crashed their servers. They were getting hundreds of thousands of hits per hour on this advertisement. And look what it's advertising. It is difficult to get the attention of the young, healthy, web native population. Now, usually when you market something, you aim at your target audience. And the target audience for assisted suicide, for the most part, are elderly people, people in their 80s. They are aiming these ads at young people. And these are the very people who are most at risk of self-inflicted death. The effects of the media on suicide are well known. Um, several studies have shown it. The World Health Organization and the American Centers for Disease Control have set up 
guidelines for the media on how to report on high profile celebrity suicides to prevent this contagion effects. Unfortunately, Compassion and Choices and the Right to Die movement have not been following these. They do just the opposite. So this is what happens to people with serious mental illnesses, even in jurisdictions where it's still a crime. Now I'm going to move on to what happens with the laws themselves. So this is a list of the countries where it's either assisted suicide or euthanasia or both are presently legal. Um, and in the United States, we have eight states and the District of Columbia. Um, it's a little bit of a misnomer to say that Montana has legalized it. That's not actually the case. It's still a crime in Montana for a physician to aid a death. Um, the distinction there is that if a doctor is charged with homicide, he can raise patient consent as a defense to the criminal prosecution. Now, because of all these different jurisdictions, I'm not going to be able to go over the details of every specific law. So I'm just going to talk about the provisions that open the door to people with mental illness. And the key here is the term suffering. Once you have a law that includes the term suffering, you open the door to mental illness because it does not distinguish between physical and mental suffering. And also it's what perspective are you using? Is it an objective, reasonable person standard or is it a subjective patient standard? Once it's defined by the patient, again, you open the door. In most states where suffering is an issue, they don't, they don't rely on a specific diagnosis. Some states or jurisdictions require the condition to be incurable. And of course, thus, for, thus far, the limitation of psychiatry is we don't know that there are any curable psychiatric conditions. The other dilemma is that a psychiatric condition could be a personality disorder. And we'll go over some of the statistics on how that comes into play in other cases. Um, and again, this is how it's happened in Canada. It must be a grievous and irremedial medical condition with a foreseeable death. Um, now, how do professional organizations react to this? And this is a, a big area of concern for me. And that when you start opening the door to people with mental illness, if you don't have the back backing of your professional organization, you could very easily get dragged into something you don't want to be involved in. It's particularly difficult when it comes to psychiatric conditions because you know, we don't have brain scans or blood tests to make a psychiatric diagnosis. We have to rely on what the patient tells us. We have to rely on what we observe. We have to rely on what other people observe and report back to us. And so there's a lot of wiggle room to make a dis misdiagnosis, to have disagreements about a specific diagnosis between clinicians. There could be a disagreement very easily about whether or not treatment guidelines had been followed and completed. Um, and so it's, it's a lot of gray area. Okay. Now in the, in the province of Quebec by um, appellate law, which you're going to be hearing more about later on today, they have excluded the reasonable foreseeable death criteria. So it's no longer confined to people who are seriously medically ill or terminally ill, which again broadens the, the pool of eligible candidates to people with mental illnesses. Okay. Now, fortunately, here in the United States, we do not have suffering as a criterion for any of the, any of the lethal medication laws. Um, so far, we have not euthanized, legalized euthanasia, although that could be read into the statutes, but technically speaking, it's illegal. We only have assisted suicide, and suffering is not a criteria. The majority of people who actually get lethal medication are not suffering. They're not in pain. They're not disabled. Um, it's based upon prognosis rather than diagnosis. So again, psychiatric conditions could be included. Um, a lot of people are under the misapprehension that psychiatric conditions are not terminal unless the person kills themselves, and that's not true. Serious depression, particularly depressions that could degrade into catatonia, can lead to death by debilitation. 
uh, anorexia nervosa is kind of the classic case. This is a psychiatric disorder that has the highest mortality rate of any psychiatric condition, even with treatment. There have been cases of anorexia nervosa that have been allowed to be euthanized in other countries. So far, that has not happened yet in the United States, but we are entering the era of palliative care psychiatry, and I'll be touching on that a little bit more later. So what have been the results of these laws? Okay. Fortunately, we have a, at least one good case review out of the Netherlands, and here are some of the diagnoses that people have been euthanized for. Depression, anxiety, post-traumatic stress disorder, psychosis, bipolar disorder, somatoform disorders are uh, a condition in which someone expresses their emotional distress through physical symptoms. It doesn't mean that they're physically ill or have a broken part somewhere in their body. It's just how they, they express distress. So they could have multiple symptoms in multiple organs. And that was actually the, the case of one of the, the uh, people who died as the result of Lawrence Egbert's review. Um, this was a woman in Arizona who had somatoform disorder. She also had psychotic symptoms and believed that rats were poisoning her through the ceiling of her apartment. She was delusional about being terminally ill, and yet the Final Exit Network was involved in helping her kill herself. Substance use disorders. So these, again, are classic conditions that are not terminal. They don't have a six-month prognosis. They're psychiatric disorders that cause distress to the individual. And if you have suffering as a criterion in your law, that's how this gets in. So someone who has a substance use disorder and is distressed by it, then they have the, an intolerable condition by their definition. Okay. Now this is the issue with personality disorders. So the problem in psychiatry is that one of them, there's more than one, but one of the problems is that we tend to use the medical model for situations that aren't medical. And that's the issue when you come to personality disorder diagnoses. So if you have a law that says the condition must be incurable, then by definition, a personality disorder would fit. So personality disorders are personality traits that are inborn, enduring, and that cause disruption and distress to the individual and to others. A personality isn't something that can be cured. So you can teach someone how to change their thinking. They can teach them, you can teach them how to change their behaviors. You can help them learn better adaptive problem solving skills, but the traits themselves will endure. They're, they're persistent. It's not curable. And so if you give someone a personality disorder diagnosis, you're essentially giving them a ticket to death, depending on the country you're working in. Personality disordered people are hard to deal with. They tend to, to alienate the people who would help them. They tend to be socially isolated, either through their own actions or the effects they have on other people and they're hard. They can be exhausting to care for. If you have a clinician with a lot of personality disorders in your clinic, it can be a tough thing. And so there's, it can be an unconscious tendency to reject these people and to try to get rid of them. You know, give them to another clinician, hope they drop out of treatment. These are the unconscious wishes of mental health clinicians treating a severe personality disorder. We have to be aware of them. We have to watch for them. And we have to remember not to reject the patient in spite of their behaviors. And yet here we have under these laws, people with personality disorders being killed by their own doctors. Now, there's some disagreement about whether or not dementia counts or falls in the domain of psychiatry or neurology. Nevertheless, this is a psychiatric diagnosis in our statistical manual that qualifies people for death. Um, in some jurisdictions, advanced directives are allowed to uh, be a basis for euthanasia. Um, which essentially means that someone at the time of their death may not want to die, and that has been an issue. More recently, um, 68 
people with mental illness were euthanized in the Netherlands. We're now up to, rather than having half being killed by a psychiatrist, two thirds of them are being killed by a psychiatrist. So you can see the, the creeping effects on the profession itself, that more people are willing to do this. 76% of the people were killed at a special center. So what you're looking at is a situation where, you know, if someone has a psychiatric condition rather than being euthanized by their family physician or general practitioner, they're being referred to a specialty center. Um, and now for the first time, and this is where I as a forensic psychiatrist get very concerned. My clinical practice and all of my forensic work are in state facilities, either in a state forensic hospital or a prison. And now for the first time, we're starting to see institutionalized patients being killed. And these are the three cases that were specifically mentioned. The first one was an insanity quitty, like my gentleman who was delusional about being terminally ill. So this fellow was 70 years old. He had emphysema, obsessive compulsive disorder, and autistic spectrum disorder. He was evaluated and allowed to be euthanized. The second case was very similar to my young woman who had been arrested and wanted to be euthanized. She was a homicide offender, had killed a relative, was deeply grief stricken by what she had done, but she had a severe personality disorder with chronic suicide attempts, was periodically hospitalized in the prison psychiatric infirmary. She was seen, and this is really concerns me, she was seen by a forensic psychiatrist, someone who should be experienced in caring for these people and helping them survive, actually approved the death. And she was euthanized the day after her release from prison. The final case, again, another forensic case, a young man with antisocial and borderline personality traits, again, that, that's a qualifying condition had a history of fire setting, disruptive behavior, self-injury. He had periodically been incarcerated or involuntarily admitted to a psychiatric hospital. And the hospital felt that he was too dangerous to be released, that his personality disorder was incurable. And the person who determined that he was approved for euthanasia felt that because he was in a controlled and supervised setting, he wasn't being coerced into doing this because he would have the freedom to change his mind. There was apparently no consideration of the coercive nature of the confinement or in the institution itself. So how often is this happening? Now, I hear this every year in my testimony when we have to deal this with this, that you know these, these deaths are really a small proportion of the total number of deaths in any given jurisdiction. But the point isn't the absolute numbers. The point is the growth rate. And what we see in every case where this becomes a law, there is exponential growth, quite dramatic growth. In the Netherlands, you know, it may be one to 4% of all deaths, psychiatric basis for it, but look at how it's growing, 140% 36% per year. That's incredible. Similar in other countries. And here's the growth rate specifically for psychiatric euthanasia. You're going from less than 10 to within six years to six, 60. And then in 2019, it was 68. Now those absolute numbers sound small, but look at how quickly it's expanding. If you make death easy, more people will want it. When death becomes easier than life with mental illness, that's a problem. This is from the United States. So these numbers are drawn from the annual reports from the state of Oregon, which is the state that has the oldest law in the country. Mm -hmm. And the blue line represents the number of lethal prescriptions that have been written over time. The pink bars represent an estimate of the number of people who have clinical depression. We know from, from epidemiology studies that among people with terminal illness, about a quarter of them will have a treatable clinical depression. And so that's what the pink bar represents. The concerning part of this graph are the black bars. The black bars are the number of people who were referred for psychiatric evaluation. 
And I've spoken to the psychiatrist in Oregon who did a number of these initial evaluations. And what she told me was that she was quickly swamped with referrals. There, there just weren't enough doctors to do all this. And so you see from 98, 99, when it first came out, she was kind of keeping up, the people were being recognized to now almost nobody gets seen. And this was acknowledged. The, the Oregon Health Sciences University was the facility that was uh, where most of the prescriptions were being written. And they set up a guidebook for doctors who were willing to be involved. And in this guidebook, they admit that their own laws did not adequately protect all people with mental illness. Ironically, that guidebook is now missing from the Health Sciences website. They've also taken it down from the Oregon Health Department website. I have a copy. And in a law review article, uh, the psychiatrist or the, who did most of these early evaluations also reviewed cases. She found the same thing, that the existing American laws do not provide safeguards to, to assure that the patients are of sound mind at the time of the prescription. And she called on a need for more active screening and surveillance for people with mental illness. Now, implications for clinicians. Uh, I've given this talk to professional audiences, um, psychiatrists and psychologists, other mental health professionals, and the reaction I sometimes informally get is, you know, why, I don't have to worry about this because I'm never going to be involved, I'm never going to participate, and under these laws I have the right to refuse. And the point that I make is, that's what you think. We're in the era of palliative care psychiatry. People are writing about this now especially when it comes to anorexia nervosa. The state of New Jersey recently for the first time uh, in one of the few cases released a person with anorexia from a state hospital to a hospice program and she ultimately died in hospice. This was before New Jersey passed their assisted suicide law. So presently a case like this would be allowed to get a lethal prescription. But the trick is, again, how do you define a prognosis? How do you define a terminal condition when it comes to psychiatric disorders? We don't have that. Um, this is one proposed definition. A long-term residential care patient with severe chronic schizophrenia and insufficient quality of life. Where have we heard this before? You know, who determines quality of life? I work in a forensic hospital with some of the most treatment resistant psychiatric cases you've ever seen. People who have been tried on multiple antipsychotic medications, people who have difficulty going for a week of a, at a time without assaulting someone because of their psychosis. And yet I have seen amazing responses to new medications. You know, I've seen clozapine, I don't want to use the term cure, but as far as we get to cure within psychiatry, I've seen amazing clozapine responses. We have new therapies being developed um, every, every year that are in trial right now. And so this definition covers the patients that I see in my forensic hospital that I do evaluations on. And it would be very premature to say that they were untreatable or incurable. Now we're going to talk a little bit about professional responses, and, and this is what really concerns me. So our professional medical organizations should be taking the lead at assuring access to care, preventing inappropriate deaths, identifying and treating people who still have a quality of life in spite of some people's objective assessments. And under this particular case, a representative from the Canadian Medical Association said that well, you know, if you don't want to do an effective referral, if you don't want to do it yourself, then maybe you should leave medicine or change to another specialty. Look at all these things you could do. So if you don't want to kill someone, you could do hair restoration, dermatology, aviation evaluations. Okay. This, is, this is a professional organization suggesting this to their own members. Here in the United States, we have a more serious problem. And again, this is a hypothetical, and I've often been accused of hypotheticals that eventually become mm -hmm. reality. 
in the United States, the state of California passed their assisted suicide law in 2016. The California Health Department promptly adopted a regulation, and I have the citation here, that says their state hospitals must offer this. Now, simultaneously, the California Division of Correction, their prison system, went in just the opposite direction. They categorically barred access to assisted suicide to any convicted prisoner. And for those of you who are attorneys, you recognize this as immediately a due process equal protection violation under the American Constitution. So you could have an individual who has committed a crime and also has a serious mental illness. If they happen to be in a psychiatric hospital, you must provide this service. If they get sent to a prison system, they're categorically barred from accessing this medical service. And that is just a classic um, equal protection violation. Um, and it's unconstitutional. It has not been challenged yet. It'll be interesting to see what happens. The other challenge um, is that in America, we have a federal law, this, the Civil Rights of Institutionalized Persons Act. This federal law requires every state institution to provide suicide prevention services. So if you work in a state like California where the hospital system must do it, you could be found in contempt of court for failing to provide it under state law, but you could be found in violation of a federal civil right under federal law. So you're damned if you do and you're damned if you don't. This is the, the classic dilemma that the psychiatrists get, would get placed in if these laws pass. So what does any of this have to do with me? And this is the question that comes up with my colleagues when I talk to fellow psychiatrists. I don't have to be involved. I don't have to participate. I don't have to deal with any of this. And that is absolutely naive. If you are a geriatric psychiatrist, you will have a patient who may want this. If you treat people with HIV or AIDS, you will have to deal with this. So when you look at mortality statistics in Oregon and you compare what percentage of natural deaths are made up of people with HIV, what percentage of deaths through assisted suicide are made up of people with HIV, there's a three to four fold higher rate of deaths by, by assisted suicide than by natural death. So people with HIV are more likely to request assisted suicide. If you work in consult liaison medicine, you may be called to do a capacity assessment. And I, I like the one, the picture on the lower right, if you work behind bars in a state facility, in a, in a prison, a jail, or in a state hospital, you should, could be involved because you're it. You are the treating psychiatrist. And under American law, it's the treating psychiatrist, the one who has ongoing responsibility for the care of the patient, whether they take the medicine or not. They're the ones who have to write the prescription. And in a state psychiatric hospital, that attending doctor is a psychiatrist. Okay. I also like to run through some scenarios that can come up. And some of these are hypothetical, some of them are not. So if you are a treating psychiatrist, you have to assess not just capacity, but on, under American laws, you also have to make sure it's voluntary. You have to assess non-coercion. And this is the piece that gets missed a lot when people debate this. How do you assess lack of coercion or voluntariness, okay? As a forensic psychiatrist, I do capacity assessments all the time. So most of the capacity assessments I do are, are pretrial assessments of ca capacity to participate in a criminal prosecution. Um, what it involves is an interview with the person. It involves a review of medical records. It involves interviews with collateral historians, people who know the person well, but also people who are more remotely removed from the situation who don't have a dog in the fight, so to speak. You have to have the freedom to talk to many different people. And the problem under these laws is that they don't just affect a single law. So if you pass these laws, you're also going to have to alter your medical confidentiality laws. Because if you're going to assess coercion, you have to be, have the freedom to talk to anybody who might have relevant information, including information about coercion. If you have a patient who's being coerced, they can just say, no, no, you can't talk to that person because they know what's really going on. 
So you would have to modify your confidentiality laws to allow that freedom for an evaluation. Okay, case scenario two, if you are the treating psychiatrist, you know that the patient lacks capacity. You've told the uh, prescribing doctor that the patient lacks capacity, but the person nevertheless requires ongoing psychiatric care. This is the classic death row dilemma. So if someone's on death row, they're incompetent to be executed, but you're the correctional psychiatrist, you have to provide for their psychiatric care, knowing that indirectly you could be leading to their death. It creates a serious medical, moral, ethical dilemma for the treating clinician. Okay, this is not a hypothetical situation. What happens if you're the treating cl clinician and you detect coercion? So, you, you, you know, you've done your assessment, you, they possess capacity, but you know this person is under the influence of a more powerful figure. There is no way to challenge a faulty assessment. So, you know, the, the, the person doing the co coercion can doctor shop, and that's what happened in the Kate Shaney case. They found another psychologist because the psychiatrist decided the person was coerced. They just found someone else who gave a different opinion. There is no way for a family member or someone who is aware of coercion to challenge the process, to offer more evidence. There's no legal mechanism to do this under these laws. Finally, the concealed data case. Um, this is the case of Michael Freeland. This is, this is the single published case report in the American uh, psychiatric literature about an assisted suicide involving someone with mental illness. This was a gentleman who had clinical depression before he developed lung cancer. He had attempted suicide in the past. He was given his lung cancer diagnosis and wanted to die through assisted suicide in that state where it was legal. He thought he was calling the suicide helpline by accident. He called the suicide hotline. And instead of getting death, he got psychiatric care. Um, he was civilly committed. He had his treatment, his depression treated. Um, and when his psychiatrist asked him how he was able to get a lethal prescription in spite of his psychiatric history, he said, the doctor never asked me about it. And this is, again, a serious defect in these laws that ironically now, cows are welcome, that's fine. I also welcome furry creatures and children. <laughs> um, it, in some states, we've passed what's called extreme risk protection orders. Um, these are laws that allow the police to seize guns from people who are going through a crisis. We don't have extreme risk protection orders for people who have unauthorized or illegal access to lethal medication. So if you have, if you, oh, don't, 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 see, I'm just saying it's kind of dramatic on your feet. You lose a lot more interest. If you if you have someone who so has, you have, has a lethal medication and uh, loses capacity, there's no way to legally seize that medication because it becomes that lawful property. Okay, so what, what have organizations in the United States done to oppose this? So this is, this is where it comes to some good news. We're starting to get some backbone in certain jurisdictions. These practices are starting to be challenged. And specifically, three doctors faced prosecution over the questionable death of a, a woman in Belgium. They were eventually acquitted of their criminal charges. But it called for that country to revise their standards for people with psychiatric disorders who are seeking euthanasia. It now requires the involvement of an actual psychiatrist to review the case. And some of those cases have, have leveled off a bit. Here in the United States, I'm very pleased to have been involved in this. Um, I'm a um, Maryland representative to the American Psychiatric Association's Assembly, which is our uh, uh, analogous to Congress. It's our National Congress. And uh, a colleague of mine, uh, submitted an action paper, which is analogous to a bill, asking the APA to adopt this position statement. And so this is the position of the American Psychiatric Association. The American Psychiatric Association, in concert with the American Medical Association position on medical euthanasia, holds that a psychiatrist should not prescribe or administer any intervention to a non-terminally ill person for the purpose of causing death. I was present in the assembly room when our organization voted on this. It was unanimous. There was not a single dissenting vote. 
So this is our national organization. Similarly, the American Medical Association, our national organization of, of uh, doctors in general, in spite of three attempts to get the AMA to drop their position of neutrality, they recently reaffirmed their position in June of 2019 that permitting physicians to engage in euthanasia would ultimately cause more harm than good. It's fundamentally incompatible with the physician's role as healer and would be difficult, if not impossible, to control and would pose serious societal risks. Euthanasia could readily be extended to incompetent patients and other vulnerable populations, such as the ones we're speaking about today, people with serious mental illnesses. Now, the relevance of these position statements is that this is the kind of information and evidence that gets presented in court challenges to criminal prohibitions. So our euthanasia position statement has been cited by the Supreme Courts of two states in the, in the United States where these challenges have been heard. And so these are very powerful statements for professional organizations to make. All right, I'm finishing a little bit early, which is good. So we have time for questions. I've also put up my email address. So if, if people uh, want to contact me afterwards, they will have access to that. Okay, so I have uh, put a question in the chat room. If anybody has a specific question, I can, I can, I can uh, uh, give that to Anne and she would answer it. Uh, you've heard a lot about uh, psychiatric cases and how assisted suicide would apply to them. Uh, absolutely, she spoke about the fact that suffering, uh, have, it being in a definition for uh, euthanasia or assisted suicide, would li uh, literally lead to euthanasia for psychiatric reasons. Uh, the other thing about it is, uh, in reference to Canada, uh, we have uh, our our losses. Euthanasia is legal for physical or psychological suffering. So obviously, psychological suffering. Uh, triggers uh, euthanasia for these uh, psychiatric type cases that are then deemed to be, um, I don't know how they could be deemed to be this way, but anyway, that are deemed to be uh, uh, non-treatable or whatever that might be. Uh, and, and so even though uh, euthanasia is not technically legal, uh, they would say it's not allowed for mental illness. Technically, it is allowed for mental illness, and it's all determined by the physician. Uh, what influence does the AMA have over state medical organizations? And that's a question from uh, Joe. Sure. Yeah, so it's, it's an interesting coordination of events. So professional organizations um, establish ethical standards and positions and guidelines. When it comes to enforcement, they have to rely on state licensing boards. So every state in the country has the equivalent of a Medical Practice Act, which sets criteria for licensure. And uh, any licensure action can be initially be filed with a, a national professional organization or a district branch. They will sometimes ask, act as peer reviewers on a case and give recommendations to a licensing board, but the actual licensure action itself would have to be through the state licensure boards. A, the APA statement says, um, okay, uh, can you mention again about the APA statement, the American Psychiatric Association statement that you were speaking about earlier? Sure. The, the, the APA position statement on euthanasia is that psychiatrists shall not be involved in any treatment intervention that is, or administer an intervention that is intended to cause the death of a patient. No, I need, I need more questions, my friends. And uh, we have a couple minutes. Is there a, a follow-up to psychiatric patients after being given lethal injection, after, after not being given lethal injection, what can be done to make it easier to get a psychiatric evaluation? Oh, that's a, I love that question. That's that's a in the days of COVID, that's a burning issue. So, there there are a lot of different models that are used for these bills. So, the new New Mexico model last year would have allowed for remote evaluations, just like we're doing our remote conference now. Um, and so, and and again, during the era of COVID, we're doing a lot of telepsychiatry, um, uh, remote appointments, remote therapy. So we're trying to get that improve access to care that way what follow-up there is if they don't take the medication that was my big concern in in some of my testimony on the bill in our state legislature 
under these laws, there was no requirement for an internist to do anything other than refuse a prescription. So under normal circumstances, someone who's thinking about dying or expressing suicidal ideation, that would be considered a psychiatric emergency. And so to pass a law that says, well, you know, if you're not a psychiatrist, all you have to do is say, no, I'm not writing a prescription and you, there's no obligation to do anything else. That's sort of like, you know, if you have a doctor, a patient in a psychiatrist's office who's obviously having a heart attack and you don't bother to call the paramedics. Yeah, that, that was just unconscionable to me. Okay, in the U.S., does palliative psychiatry by definition, definition necessarily include physician involvement in medically assisted death? No, it does not. Um, we have palliative care and hospice programs. The majority of American palliative care and hospice programs do not have psychiatrists on staff. So that, you know, it's a scope of practice issue to a certain extent. In the U.S., the only people who can prescribe lethal medication is a, is a physician. Now, other bills <laughs> using an, a, a broader criteria would allow nurse practitioners or physician's assistants to prescribe lethal medications, but that's not currently the law in the United States. Did you want to comment on the uh, question of Bill C-7, which essentially removes that the person has to be terminally ill? Sure. Yeah, we're going to have a whole session on the C-7 bill this afternoon, which is why I didn't mention it this Yeah, point. that's right. We have actually yeah. uh, two people talking heavily about it, even myself too, so, yeah. so we can get back to that. I could make a distinction, though. I mean, one of the things I'm very fortunate about is that in the United States, our U.S. Supreme Court quickly determined that there was no U.S. constitutional right to assist with death. And so we don't have to deal with any of the broader national wide open issues that you guys are dealing with. We're dealing with it on a state by state level. And so far, universally, every state Supreme Court that's heard these cases has voted in our favor. So we've been very fortunate. Can you answer Dr. Finley's question? Um, if I can find it. Uh, Laura, it's why do you think so many physicians won't enter the debate and won't openly object? And then she asks, how much does finance influence doctors' involvement? Oh, well, those are great questions. So why aren't more people involved in objecting? Because they don't see it as an issue that will ever affect them. And, and it's a very naive view. So that's one reason. The other reason, and I've experienced this myself in some professional organizations, is that they're really afraid of dividing their membership. They're worried about people dropping out of the organization if the, the organization doesn't take the position they want. So it's a very short-sighted view. They're taking the value of the organization over the value of the individual patient's life. And that's very concerning. Um, uh, there's a question here. Did I uh, hear this correctly? Dementia as a neurological illness or mental illness. When did this debate begin? Well, what is the end goal of that debate? Well, I, it's a good question. Go on. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, the fact of the matter is both psychiatrists and neurologists are involved of the, in the care of people with dementia. It, it, there's, there's not like a iron bar between the, the specialties as far as that goes. So people with dementia can develop psychosis. They can develop delusions. They can have disruptive behaviors that require behavioral interventions. And so a lot of integrated care is involved in, in the care of people with dementia.